Welcome to Business Better, a podcast designed to help businesses navigate the new normal. I'm your host, John Wright. After serving nearly 15 years as Senior Vice President and General Counsel at Triumph Group Incorporated, a global aerospace component supplier, I'm now a member of the Securities and M&A Groups at Ballard Spar, a national law firm with clients across industries and across the country. In today's episode, we'll hear a discussion of environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, concerns from the perspective of companies and investors, including recent trends in ESG investing, the impact of the pandemic, and the ESG issues that have been the focus of companies, boards, shareholders, and proxy advisory firms in recent years. Leading the discussion are Mary Mullaney and Jaron Fields, both of whom are members of Ballard's Business and Transactions Group in the Philadelphia office. Mary Mullaney is a partner who focuses her practice on securities law disclosure, executive compensation, corporate governance, capital raising, and M&A transactions for both publicly traded and privately held companies, particularly those in the healthcare, medical device, and life sciences industries. Jaron Fields is an associate who focuses her practice on corporate finance transactions, M&A, corporate governance, and securities law disclosure. Their guest for the podcast is Zali Ahmadi, who joins us from DF King, a proxy solicitation and shareholder services company. Zali advises clients on topics such as institutional investor and proxy advisory firm voting policies and investor outreach strategy, best practices and trends regarding corporate governance and ESG-related structure and disclosure, and both quantitative and qualitative aspects of executive compensation programs. With that, We'll turn the episode over to Mary to start the conversation. We are here today to talk about environmental, social, and governance, or ESG-related concerns. These concerns represent one of the hottest topics that are important right now to companies, investors, employees, customers, regulators, press, and many other people globally. Today, we will discuss ESG concerns from the perspective of companies and investors including actions taken by companies over recent years, board oversight and leadership of ESG activities, shareholder proposals, and the view from proxy advisors. I'm going to kick this off by starting with Zali. Can you talk about some of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic that you saw in 2020? Yeah, absolutely. So during 2020, you know, this pandemic, it's really amplified the importance of ESG for a couple of different factors, right? But, you know, first, um, let's talk about the increased investment in ESG funds, right? So for the first four months of 2020, over $12 billion were invested in ESG funds. Um, It's a big deal because, you know, that's more than double the investment during the same time period last year. But I think the really notable aspect of this is just that, you know, in that initial downturn caused by the pandemic, um, you know, around March, I want to say more than 70 percent of those ESG funds, they performed better than their counterparts during that four month period. So here we have this baseline for investors or this new baseline for investors. Right. Um, There's really proof there that, you know, for investors focused on their long term returns, companies who, you know, are delving into ENS initiatives, they can help provide that strength during a period of volatility. Right. Which can help lead to those long term returns that someone like a BlackRock or a Vanguard is looking for. So we're seeing continued increase in in investment and ESG funds because of that. We, We anticipate that going forward. It's definitely been something that's been snowballing over the last five or so years, but we do anticipate that to to increase heavily. Um, Another, you know, another big impact, there's this focus on employee health and safety now, right? Um, It expands on the discussion of human capital management that everybody's really been having over the past few years. Um, But, you know, for obvious reasons now, especially in off-season engagement, um, especially in in enhanced disclosures and proxies, there is that discussion on employee health and safety and what companies are doing, what initiatives are being undertaken. On the investor side, we're seeing, uh, you know, and it, uh, continued push, right, for a focus on diversity. 
And this is diversity outside of the traditional norms that we see of, you know, board gender diversity. We're seeing a push for disclosure on workforce diversity. We're seeing a push to expand board diversity to incorporate racial and ethnic diversity. And that's done by a number of ways. We saw an increase in shareholder proposals. We saw an increase in vote support levels for those shareholder proposals. We saw a number of policies being amended on the institutional investor side. Um, so we're seeing that kind of amplified over the past year. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing that I'll note is the climate change initiatives. You know, over the past four or five years, we've seen companies, again, you know, the snowballing effect to where companies are, are reporting on their initiative or even enhancing their initiatives. Over the past year, we're seeing a lot of investors double down and reinforce, you know, their interest in this enhanced disclosure, especially because of that strong performance we've seen for those ESG funds during that downturn. So, so we are seeing, uh, you know, focus continuing on those climate change initiatives. And even going into 2021, we're already seeing shareholder proposals uh, requesting, you know, enhanced disclosure on what's happening. Things like scope three emissions, indirect GHG emissions, um, you know, disclosure that's been above and beyond what we've seen companies either traditionally disclose and above and beyond what we've seen investors ask for. I think the one other thing that I'll point out um, almost stating the obvious, right? Uh, one of the impacts that we saw was just this mass transition to virtual meetings over the past year. Um, you know, because they had to. But in most states, you couldn't have gatherings of more than 10 people during proxy season. So we saw this big influx. What that's kind of done is lay the groundwork for some of these best uh, best market practices, some good governance practices for virtual meetings. A lot of the discussion surrounds transparency issues, you know, things like the Q&A sessions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, a, a lot of these issues are now being discussed going into 2021 because pandemic is still here. We're still seeing, you know, the majority of companies focus on virtual meetings for now. It's led to some discussion from proxy advisory firms as well as to what they expect going into 2021. Now that this kind of shock factor is worn off of, you know, OK, everyone's doing a virtual meeting. Let's just get it all done. Now the focus is a little bit more on, you know, are you disenfranchising shareholder rights? And if so, you know, an advisor like Glass Lewis perhaps might recommend against board members going into 2021. So those are some of the changes that we've seen just over the past year because of COVID. Yeah, and I think Jaren and I could, you know, on the last point, uh, certainly agree with you. You know, our clients who all last year did virtual meetings, you know, at a, at a big pivot, um, planned to be in person and then pivoted to virtual you know, I think are really looking to improve the experience for everyone um, this this year, and not just getting get out. Um, and I think that's so necessary. If 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 you take away that one that one forum for sh interaction with shareholders, um, I think in the long term that will not work well for companies. So it's an interesting topic. Jaren, can you highlight some of the things we're talking about when we talk about ESG initiatives at companies? Sure, definitely. I think um, in general, a lot of the kind of recent interest in ESG in initiatives um, stems from the business roundtable statement that was signed by sort of approximately about 180 CEOs back in um, 2019. Um, I think people are probably familiar with the statement at this point, but um, essentially, it kind of rejected the longstanding notion that sort of the overall purpose of a corporation was sort of just to service and to serve shareholders. Um, and instead, um, the sort of signatories of that statement sort of agreed to sort of commit to um, serving sort of the community writ large, um, shareholders as a whole, and just sort of all the stakeholders that they kind of interact with on sort of a day to day. Um, and so I think with that kind of shift in thinking of what a corporation sort of is designed to do and what it is designed and who it's designed to serve, um, so then has kind of shifted the thinking on ESG. Um, and I think then has sort of as a corollary just generally increased sort of interest in the topic. Um, so I guess typically when we sort of think of E or environmental issues, you think of sort of carbon emissions, companies being sort of smart and thoughtful about reducing their carbon footprints. Um, and I think that's kind of sort of an issue that, you know, has kind of been out there for many, many years. Um, the S and sort of social issues is, I think, where we've seen a lot of sort of recent interest, um, which is, you know, board diversity, 
um, management diversity and just workforce diversity generally, um, employee safety and wellness. And so, again, as we sort of talk about the impact of COVID-19, um, what that sort of a work, remote work environment means for employees just um, sort of culturally as well as just, um, you know, balancing work life and um, other sort of outside um, factors or issues that people are dealing with. Um, gender pay issues. So, you know, there's been a lot of recent studies about um, females sort of making less money on the whole than um, similarly um, stationed men. And so um, there's been some sort of increased interest in that. Um, employee recruitment and retention. Um, and then corporate political spending. Um, and then with respect to the G or governance issues, it's sort of how we think about things like overboarding. So, you know, how many board directorships might be too many for a public company director to have? Um, are you sort of, do you have too much on your plate if you're serving as a director on, you know, four or five public company boards? Um, the sort of separation of the um, board chair, is it more desirable for a CEO to sort of have the role of the company CEO and board chair? Or is it better to kind of separate those two roles? Um, and then sort of, Shareholder engagement. Um, what is the threshold for shareholders to um, vote on sort of changes to company practices and um, sort of as we talk about annual meetings, what about sort of special meetings when um, shareholders want to meet to talk about um, potential company changes? How easy is that to happen? What are the steps? Um, how do we make that happen? So I think when you think of ESG, those are kind of some of the topics that you're thinking about. And as we've kind of had this sort of broader come to Jesus moment about what corporations are designed to do, um, those topics have become more and more um, of interest in the last sort of couple of years. Terrific. So now let's take these topics one at a time and we'll start with environmental. Zali, can you talk about what some of the biggest environmental shareholder proposals were in 2020 and how they fared? Yeah, that sounds good. You know, there's a lot of reporting requests, requests for additional disclosure, and that kind of spans a number of different topics, right? Um, I'd say that the most popular proposals over the past year, definitely reporting on climate change, uh, disclosure around GHG emissions. There were a handful of other proposals, things like community environmental impact, you know, what's going on with the water supply in the neighboring areas, things like renewable energy. But really, there were two topics that kind of took the cake if we're, if we're really talking about, you know, support levels and, and even just the numbers of submissions. Um, and that's going to be your reporting on climate change and your reporting on GHG emissions. <clears throat> Me. So, you know, for the reporting on climate change, that they definitely had the most submissions there. It took the number one spot. And if we're talking in terms of numbers, overall, all environmental proposals, we had about during proxy season, it was in the 80s in terms of the number of submissions. Only a quarter of those actually make it onto ballots. A lot of these environmental proposals get negotiated away um, or omitted. Uh, but, you know, the report on climate change proposals, on average, the support levels are in the 30s. It's fairly high for an environmental social related proposal. Um, but we're seeing the highest numbers there. And we're seeing a lot of shareholder engagement on this topic. The second highest in terms of submissions, we're looking at GHG emissions, any proposals related to disclosure on GHG emissions. I think the really newsworthy thing here is that, you know, it's averaging 50% support level there for GHG emissions, which is huge for, for really for any shareholder proposal, including governance proposals, which have kind of been, you know, the norm for the last decade or so. But, um, you know, GHG emissions are a really hot topic. In, going into 2021, we're already seeing new types of requests surrounding GHG emissions disclosure. So we're getting a lot of requests for, you know, well, what's going on with net zero emissions? Are you going to get there, you know, by, by a certain date? That's sort of thing. So really, a lot of the discussion is based on climate change and the GHG emissions. Um, and, you know, if, if your industry is applicable, the next, I would say the next hottest topic would probably be your community impact, um, community environmental impact there. It's interesting, you know, where a number of our clients are Pennsylvania companies, and Pennsylvania has a different fiduciary duty standard um, than i um, Delaware or, or some of the other states that follow the Delaware model where the board is specifically authorized to think about um, 
the community employees and other stakeholders in in making decisions about the company. So it, to me, it will be interesting to see kind of, you know, how, how I see my Pennsylvania companies uh, be able to deal with things and, and evaluate things as contrasted with, you know, for big corporate transactions, what the law tells Delaware corporations they should do. So it's, a, it's an interesting dichotomy that we see you know, having these these companies with the different um, the different governance model and statutory protection. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. And you know, I think if if we're going to talk about just things that we find interesting uh, uh, on this topic, one thing that I find interesting as well is just that you know the this continued presence of anti ESG proposals that we've seen over the last couple of years. So these are you know these are environmental and some social proposals that. Um, you know, where the request is really saying, can you not think about climate change if you're if you're pushing for an acquisition or some sort of transaction or even a request for a report? You know, how much is this costing shareholders, all of these climate change initiatives that you're handling? Um, and, you know, those are not receiving support. Institutional investors, again, it's not just a social movement. It's not just, you know, we care about the environment. It, it It's definitely tied back to we want strong long term returns. Right. And you know, especially after the downturn of last year, it shows that ENS focused companies are providing those strong returns. So um, this is why this is partially why a lot of these anti ESG proposals, they're just not receiving much support. It's in the single digits. Huh. That's really interesting. <laughs> Jaron, could you talk about what companies are doing in response to the concerns from shareholder proposals and other sources? Yeah, so I think they're doing sort of a lot of outward facing things to kind of just sort of allay um, the interest and some of the concern that um, stakeholders are having. So um, I think what you're seeing sometimes is the creation of sort of separate committees to sort of deal with um, ESG um, topics sort of separate and above from the board sort of as a whole. Um, there's definitely been an increase recently in um, the creation of these ESG committees to think sort of more critically and specifically about climate change, um, diversity, and, and the like. Um, and then similarly, I think companies are just being really savvy about their public disclosures. Um, what are they saying about climate change? What are they committing to? Um, what are they putting on their websites um, above and beyond what's in their sort of Securities Act filings? Um, really just making information available, I think, um, and we've kind of touched on this, but I think a lot of shareholder proposals are really just asking for information. Um, and so I think companies are sort of getting ahead of that stuff so that they're putting out information on their own terms so that they're not really having to deal with perhaps um, a shareholder proposal that might be a little bit more onerous than um, than what they might be willing to do or what they might have data or information for right now. Um, Similarly, I think there's just sort of a, an increase in these kind of virtue signaling um, corporate pledges. I think we can sort of debate the efficacy of the pledges, but um, I think especially in the climate space, there's, um, I think there's the, what they call the climate pledge, which has been signed by sort of a number of large public companies, um, which is just sort of a commitment to um, net zero emissions. And so, um, and, and, um, uh, I think the goals are a little bit more aggressive than those that are in the Paris Agreement. But um, I think some of that is just investors seeing that you've signed or that you've agreed to this pledge, um, just putting their concerns at ease, at least for now, until you can kind of evaluate what that means in the long term. Um, so, you know, query, I think we can discuss and debate if, you know, what that actually means for tangible change. But I think a lot of companies are taking at least sort of the easy step of signing um, these public pledges, posting those public pledges on their website, um, issuing press releases saying that they've signed these public pledges, um, which at least then sort of gets the word out there that they're thinking about these topics. Okay. And one, one of the things I'm seeing also increasingly is the use of ESG metrics for incentive compensation, which I think, you know, shifts nicely into the discussion on the social aspects of ESG. Um, I've seen lots of companies um, really putting either safety metrics, you know, employee safety metrics or or other ESG related uh, incentives to kind of put the bonus money where 
the mouth is kind of uh, uh, approach. So I think it's it, it's an interesting use of, of ESG that I think we're going to see a whole lot more of as, as we move forward. So, Zelly, can you talk about the social piece now? Can we shift to that? And what are some sh- shareholder proposals in that area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but just to add to what you've said on, you know, adding, incorporating ESG into executive compensation, I just had a conversation with, with a company about this recently. And, you know, we're talking about the shareholder proposals. Um, the majority of, of, or really just compensation related shareholder proposals in general, that topic tying ESG into executive comp has dominated the compensation proposal landscape. And, and really that's kind of where the discussion is. Um, they aren't passing as of yet, but, you know, increased levels of support every year. Um, and even, you know, just if we're just talking about committee responsibilities, compensation committees, uh, you know, it's almost 30% of the S&P now have actually tied some sort of social responsibility to their compensation committee. So we're talking corporate culture. We're talking, really, we're talking human capital management type of responsibilities. They're being tied to the compensation committee there. And we're even seeing a couple of companies change the names of their compensation committees to reflect this kind of enhanced focus, increased focus on social issues there. Um, so that's a really good segue into, into what's going on just in the social space in general. Um, if I take a step, step back and I'm talking about, you know, what we're seeing in terms of trends for social shareholder proposals, um, I would be remiss if I not, did not just acknowledge political contributions and lobbying. Uh, you know, it's, it takes the number one spot every year. And, you know, it, due to the nature of it being an election year last year, of course, more passed, right? Five proposals uh, passed during proxy season last year, uh, a, hand, a couple more than what we saw the previous year. And, you know, this topic isn't going away. This sort of political divide in the country has not, uh, you know, gotten better. So we anticipate more political contributions proposals. They're averaging, uh, you know, in the 30s for shareholder support, where we don't see significant swings either way in terms of support levels or, or even submissions. But what I really want to talk about are proposals related to uh, diversity. So board diversity and EEO reporting specifically. And the reason I want to talk about those um, is because of these significant shifts in support levels that we saw. Um, board diversity in particular, it, you know, it doubled in support the last year. So now it's hovering in the 30s. But, you know, previously it was about 14, 15 percent average shareholder support. So we're seeing large increases um, in support. We're seeing, you know, amendments to voting policies for institutional investors. You know, we're seeing a lot of focus on diversity in general. Um, EEO reporting as well, I, I think I think is one of the biggest New, you know, the biggest uh, pieces of news from proxy season last year was just that EEO proposals, shareholder proposals, they're averaging around 53 percent support, which is so high, especially for any environmental social proposals. Those proposals typically don't get as high, you know, support levels. Um, so this is a really big deal, you know, at least in the shareholder proposal world, uh, you know, it's backed by a number of initiatives, letter writing campaigns, shareholder proposal campaigns. Again, investors want to talk about this stuff during engagement. Um, so the, within the social realm, those two proposals are definitely making big waves. All of this falls under that bucket of human capital management. I, I know I keep saying this word, but really it's, you know, it's some of the biggest... It, News comes under that bucket just over the last couple of years. If we're talking proxy disclosures, uh, the most, you know, for ENS disclosures in the proxy statement, human and capital management takes the number one spot in terms of what's changed over the past two years. If we're talking even just rulemaking petitions, right? Human Capital Management Coalition, it's a group of 25 institutional investors. They asked the SEC to adopt rules requiring issuers to disclose info about their human capital. And then even for shareholder proposals, right? Which is the focus of what I'm talking about here. Those proposals are remaining very strong in 2020. We anticipate that to continue for 2021. You know, topics that fall under this, it's employment diversity, it's EEO reporting, it's gender racial pay gap, um, sexual harassment proposal, gender identity and sexual orientation discrimination, all of this, anything that relates to the management of your human capital. And of course, all of that has been amplified by the, the pandemic and its effect on the workforce. That's terrific. Thanks, Sally, for talking about that. Jaren, could, could you talk a little bit more about diversity as we shift to that, you know, what you're seeing as the focus at companies? 
Um, as an initial matter, I guess we sort of have to think about what diversity is and what it means. I think people define diversity differently, um, whether you're thinking about gender diversity, racial or ethnic diversity, or, you know, diversity with respect to sexual orientation or identification. Um, there's kind of a broad term of diversity, and I think people tend to think about diversity differently. So um, I think we just have to kind of keep that in mind when we're having the discussion. But I think the interest and um, the movement has been coming from different places. Um, you've had um, the state of California, which essentially passed into law a requirement that um, there has to be a certain number of um, what they define as diverse board members on public company boards that are organized in the state of California. Um, depending on the board size, that can be up to three people. Um, so that's going to phase in the next year or two. So that's the sort of a state um, sort of regulating the participants um, in the market of that particular state. Um, you have NASDAQ, who announced uh, about, in I think, December, um, a rule change that's going to require um, a certain level of um, disclosure around diversity and then um, just general sort of board diversity on um, with respect to any company that is listed on a NASDAQ exchange. Um, depending on the exchange, um, the requirements will be a little bit different as will the phase in period. But um, again, now you have an exchange stepping in um, to sort of signal the importance of diversity um, to them and um, to the market writ large. Um, as of yet, um, the SEC sort of hasn't formally weighed in, but um, now that um, there's some turnover at the SEC and the acting chairwoman is, um, you know, Alison Heron Lee, um, I think that's some people tend to think and, and expect that the SEC may begin to sort of formally implement um, some disclosure requirements with respect to human capital generally, but specifically with respect to um, diversity. So, you know, maybe not necessarily requirements for directors and sort of board composition, but at least to disclose um, what information companies have and, and the demographics of their boards um, and employees. Um, and then you have investors themselves. Um, you have sort of the activist investors who, as Sally said, are, are um, submitting shareholder proposals for um, data or um, just increase board diversity generally. And then you have these sort of, I guess, anti-ESG investors who um, I think in, in the diversity space are not saying sort of outwardly, you know, diversity is bad as much as uh, asking people to sort of think more broadly about what can constitute diversity. So often that can be, you know, diversity of thought or, you know, political orientation or, or what have you. Um, but there certainly seems to be an increase in shareholder proposals, as Zali mentioned, sort of hitting on those topics. And then you also have sort of increased interest in um, diversity issues coming from um, ISS and Glass-Lewis, um, who, again, have weighed in on um, board diversity. I think ISS has, and I can talk about this a little bit later, but um, ISS has basically agreed um, to vote no on nominating and governance chair people um, when boards lack diversity. Um, I think they've already been doing that when boards lack um, gender diversity. Uh, but now, again, um, they're making similar promises with um, with respect to racial and ethnic diversity. And, and Glass-Lewis, similarly, um, it didn't go quite as far, but um, definitely signaled that they are going to be looking very critically at um, what companies are sort of disclosing about diversity and um, what they're doing to, um, you know, promote diversity at the board level and among their workforces. I think you've raised an interesting topic about the SEC and their disclosure regime. I know, you know, we've all been living for years now with the uh, added description of skills, qualifications and experience of directors to try and show some of what's important to the company in individual board members. I uh, the, you know, new disclosure rules of the SEC that became effective in November particularly regarding human capital, have uh, raised, a, a, you know, engendered a lot of debate and questions as companies start to grapple with that. 
I know we've put questions in DNO questionnaires regarding diversity topics that we hadn't had in there before. And it's kind of interesting to see some of the discomfort with which individual folks are dealing with being asked questions that they perhaps don't don't feel are are something that the company needs to know. Uh, so, you know, I think there's on ESG disclosure generally and perhaps human capital, the SEC took a step with the November disclosure rules, but but basically didn't do anything substantial yet on ESG disclosures generally. So I, I do I do agree with you that I think that is the next step. I'm Zelly, can we talk a little bit about governance and some of the common proposals and outcomes for 2020 in the governance space? Yeah, that makes sense. The G in ESG. Um, I think to sort of preface this, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, the governance proposals, they're always in a little bit of a more black and white area versus the environmental and social ones. You know, um, for governance, we more or less know, you know, once you get a governance shareholder proposal, we know, for example, we how ISS will likely recommend for or against this, how Glass-Lewis will, um, how institutional investors will vote on this. So, um <clears throat> Uh, and, you know, the, the proposal landscape as well, it, it really is dominated by what some refer to as, as retail gadflies. Um, so these are the types of proponents we're dealing with. It's why a lot, you know, most of the governance proposals, they end up on ballots. There's not a lot of negotiation going on here, right? Um, and that's why it, it becomes so important to really know, you know, how ISS Class Lewis investors will vote for or against these. Um, that being said, there are a few topics that are really kind of the darlings of the the gadflies, um, that being written consent, you know, written consent took the number one spot in terms of submissions, um, also special meeting provisions, things like uh, majority voting, reduce, el- reduce or eliminate super majority voting, and of course, you know, requiring independent chairmen. Um, a couple of, of notable events from last year, you know, uh, reducing or eliminating super majority voting, those proposals, those are averaging almost 80% support, right? Um, so that's a pretty scary proposal for a company if they receive that. Um, it's really hard to wiggle you know, or negotiate out of that one, um, it will likely pass. Uh, written consent and special meeting, those usually go hand in hand. Oftentimes investors, if you have one, you know, they're okay with you not having the other. Um, but those two proposals are in the top three there. And they're, you know, special meetings averaging in the 40s, which is pretty high. Written consent in the 30s. <clears throat> And then, you know, there's the requiring independent chair. Uh, a couple of those passed this last year. That was kind of the biggest news with that proposal. Um, you know, it, only a couple. So it's not as though there's this big shift from investors to where they're not suddenly not OK with the structure of, you know, combined chair CEO along with lead independent director. But there are there are at least two investors that we did see flip their positions where they traditionally voted against this proposal. They're now voting for all of these proposals. So just something to keep in mind, you know, those traditional government issues that may feel a little bit passe now that ENS issues are coming to the forefront, those issues are still really important for investors. And a lot of their viewpoints on those are, are a little bit more black and white there. So, um, you know, just important to keep in mind what your governance profile looks like. And I think from my experience, you know, this is what these governance proposals is where shareholder proposals really started to show uh, success. You know, they managed to be the driver for proxy access and and um you know destaggering of boards and things that we all pretty much take for granted now. So, you know, it it's it's an interesting view if you look long term um, <laughs> that totally. maybe we're seeing the infancy of some of the other proposals. Yeah. And, you know, those governance topics, they're incredibly successful. You know, you mentioned proxy access and de-staggering of the board. You know, there's a reason those aren't in the top, you know, three, four, five, six proposals anymore for governance. And it's because the majority of S&P have already, you know, gotten rid of their staggered boards. They've already, majority have already adopted proxy access. And those are due to incredibly successful shareholder proposal campaigns, you know, in addition to, of course, shareholder engagement and and the usual routes of change. But um, yeah, governance proposals, definitely something to still keep an eye on. Just, you know, understanding governance risks there is very important in addition to the to the burgeoning ENS issues. 
So why don't we wrap up this discussion, Jaron, with asking you to talk a little bit more, as you said you would, on the proxy advisor firms and, and what they're saying in this in this area. Yeah. So I guess sort of as a corollary to that is I think you kind of touched on, Mary, I think we might be sort of at that sort of stage where these proposals now that are slowly gaining support with respect to diversity issues and some climate change matters, um, you know, perhaps 10, 15 years from now, we might be in a place where it's just a foregone conclusion that, you know, public companies have a certain level of board diversity or have made certain commitments about um, climate change. So I think it really will be interesting to see um, how the landscape shifts such an such that we may be in a place where we are just sort of taking those things for granted, while um, right now they seem to be kind of pretty contentious topics. Um, but I think at least in the near term, um, the proxy advisory firms have certainly weighed in on ESG and I think have made clear that um, ESG will be at their forefront, um, certainly next year and probably indefinitely until um, things sort of significantly change. Um, as I mentioned, ISS in the forthcoming year um, has agreed for sort of the largest cap companies um, to flag in their reports um, the companies that sort of have no apparent um, racial or ethnic diversity. So um, they do note the word apparent. So, you know, query whether a company may want to proactively disclose um, the racial or ethnic diversity of their board members if it's not obvious. Um, be it putting pictures up on their websites or adding disclosure in in their um, Exchange Act filings. Um, I think for a few years, they've been recommending against nominating chairs um, of all male boards, as I mentioned, but um, they've recently announced that beginning in, I think, 2022, um, they will do the same where the board lacks um, racial diversity as well. Um, and so similarly, Glass-Lewis has, um, again, weighed in on the importance of ESG. Um, I think for the forthcoming year, they already, again, have had a longstanding or fairly longstanding policy of um, generally voting against nominating and governance chairs um, of all male boards where there's no female directors. Um, but they've recently announced that for this year, um, they'll also note as a concern boards where there's only one female director. So, um, you know, a signal that the sort of slow incremental change to sort of, you know, just check the box might not be enough um, for, for firms like Glass Lewis. Um, and so additionally this year, um, they've announced that they're um, beginning in 2022 um, going to recommend no votes for nominating governance chairs. Um, of boards with less than two female directors. So again, you see them trying to um, really, you know, push companies to 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 act swiftly with respect to gender diversity on boards. Um, and then similarly, with respect to ethnic diversity, um, Glass Lewis announced that they're going to sort of begin to analyze, um, you know, just an overall assessment of um, companies' disclosure with respect to ethnic diversity. So. Um, you know, that's reviewing their proxy materials, um, their filings, as well as other information that companies are putting out there, um, as well as kind of how they're thinking about these topics. So um, what are companies thinking about when they think about diversity? Is it diversity of skill, experience? Um, they're thinking about what kind of factors companies are looking at um, and sort of evaluating those as well. Um, and so that's going to be in Glass Lewis's estimation, sort of a factor in their recommendations. But um, unlike ISS, they've not made sort of a, a blanket, you know, promise to recommend um, one way or another if certain metrics aren't met. Um, and um, BlackRock and Vanguard too have sort of spoken out recently in their um, their reports for the forthcoming year about the importance of this topic. Um, they're again asking for increasing disclosures, um, asking for, you know, information for them to sort of make, um, value judgments about what companies are doing with respect to diversity. But like Glass Lewis, neither Vanguard or BlackRock have made firm commitments one way or another about, um, how they will, um, recommend votes for, um, companies that may fall short, um, of the sort of guidelines that they've laid forth in the forthcoming year. So I think it's something interesting to kind of evaluate as the year unfolds. Um, obviously, as shareholder proposals roll in, um, it'll be interesting to see how companies address them and, um, you know, what the, the major proxy advisory firms um, and investors have to say sort of for 2022. 
Terrific. Well, Zali and and Jaren, thank you so much for joining me on this topic. It's been a terrific discussion. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thanks again to Mary Mullaney and Jaren Fields and their guest, Zali Amadi. Make sure to visit our website, www.ballardspar.com, where you can find the latest news and guidance from our attorneys. Subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. If you have any questions or suggestions for the show, please email podcast at ballardspar.com. Stay tuned for a new episode coming soon. Thank you for listening.